Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for tuning in. My name is Tom Schmelk, and I'm one of the forest entomologists with the Maine Forest Service. Um, Winter Moth is one of the programs that I lead. Um, but today we have Dr. Joe Elkinton here uh, from UMass Amherst to um, sort of give us an overview of uh, winter moth and biological control for winter moth in New England. Um, but first, a couple of notes and some housekeeping. Um, so this is a monthly series, and uh, the information about this monthly series will be shared on the main Forest Service calendar. I'll put a link for that in the chat. Um, but just a heads up, over the next few months, some of the topics that we'll be discussing. Um, so in October, the Forest Protection Division will provide a provide information on Christmas tree and wreath brush harvesting. Um, in November, our biometricians Jeremy Frank will provide a report on forest modeling results. And then for December, um, we're going to provide a look back at um, this year in 2000. Um, so for some housekeeping, um, so those of you who are registered for pesticide credits, um, if there are multiple people in the room that are on the same computer um, who need credits and are not identifiable by the login, um, they need to be announced in the chat. Um, or you can reach out to forest, foresthealth at maine.gov um, just to let us know that there's multiple people um, on, on the laptop. Uh, so in order to get credit for this, you must attend the full session and complete and submit an online quiz um, by 1 p.m. today to be considered for credit. Um, and like I mentioned before, if multiple licensees are viewing the session together, the full name of those licensees must be shared in the chat or to forest at main.gov when re requested during the meeting. Um, each person seeking credit must complete the quiz and a passing score on the webinar content related questions must be attained for credit to be awarded. Um, if you have any difficulties with um, the form or the quiz or require an alternate format, um, please contact us at that uh, forest health at main gov or at 207-287-2431. Um, and I'll post all of this information as well as the quiz link um, in the chat here. Cool, okay, actually it's already posted. Thank you. Okay, so just an uh, introduction uh, for our speaker uh, today. Uh, like I mentioned, it's Dr. Joe El Elkinson, um, and he is a professor of entomology at the Department of Environmental Conservation at the University of Massachusetts at Am Amherst. Uh, he joined the faculty at UMass in 1980 after receiving his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, his laboratory conducts research on population dynamics and biological control of invasive forest insects. He devoted uh, his first the first half of his career to unraveling gypsy moth population dy dynamics. Uh, gypsy moth is now uh, officially named spongy moth. Um, so he and his collaborators revealed the effect of small mammal predators and the role of pathogens, including the establishment of the fungal uh, pathogen Entomophaga mymyga in 1989 that fundamentally changed the spongy moth system. His more recent focus has been on the biological control and population dynamics of winter moth, emerald ash borer, and hemlock woolly adelgid. He is currently involved with efforts to introduce predatory insects from the Pacific Northwest to control hemlock woolly adelgid, parasitoids from the Far East to control emerald ash borer, and a tachinid parasite parasitoid that he uh, that is introduced to control winter moth. Uh, this work has led to the successful control of winter moth throughout New England. Until 2016, it was causing an average of 45,000 acres of defoliation of forest trees in Massachusetts. Since then, virtually no defoliation has occurred, and we expect that to be a permanent fix. Um, they're now working hard to extend that control along the entire coast of Maine. Um, and without further ado, I will hand it over to Joe. Hello, folks. It's very glad. I'm very glad to be here. I've always enjoyed working with my colleagues in Maine. And like I say, that's our, our main focus on the Winter Moth uh, project now. And I'll touch a little bit on that, that aspect of the project later. But uh, Winter Moth, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to talk about um, 
the introduction life cycle and spread of winter moth in New England, the successful biocontrol, the maintenance of low-density populations after biocontrol, and a little bit on of the work led by Jeremy Anderson in my lab on the population genetics of winter moth. <clears throat> we first heard about uh, what turned out to be winter moth uh, north and south of Boston, there was an outbreak of inchworms, which we assume to be a native species. We have certain native species like fall cankerworm that periodically cause little outbreaks, but those outbreaks don't last more than a couple of years. This one persisted. And then we had a flight in late December at Christmas time uh, uh, in 2002. None of the native species like fall cankerworm fly that late. It immediately suggested it might be winter moth because it's called winter moth in Europe because it flies in, in, in December, in early winter. And that was confirmed by our taxonomic collaborators in, in Yukon and, and Cornell. Well, I was delighted to actually work on winter moth because it's a very famous insect in, based on European work. This little book was published by Vardy, Gradwell, and Hazard's Hassel when I was a graduate student and sort of laid out the, the, the techniques that we used to study insect population ecology. It was all based on their work on winter moth at Oxford University in England. So it went on. It was also a famous example of biological control, which I'll talk about. Uh, and that was done in Nova Scotia in the 1950s. And it became a big deal all over New England, causing lots of defoliation. It, it, winter moth loves almost any deciduous trees. It's a big pest on apples. Those are shows defoliated apple trees. It became a big problem on blue high bush blueberries. In our part of the in our part of the, the state, I'm not sure what's the deal with it in Maine, but at any rate, um, it defoliates almost any decision. Oak trees, maple trees. Here's a the Norway maple tree down on Cape Cod, completely defoliated by winter moth. And one of the problems with the defoliation is that once the outbreak starts, it just goes on and on and on year after year, and then the trees start to die. Unlike spongy moth and you know, what used to be called gypsy moth where the population collapse after a few years, there is no pathogen of, of winter moth that knocks the populations down. So the outbreak continues year after year. The densities are huge. I mean, we've estimated there are about, a, in these outbreak populations, there are 100,000 caterpillars per tree. And it causes this tattering type of damage because a lot of the damage happens in the bud before the leaves open and the little holes become big holes. So winter moth, um, Overwinters of the egg stage shown here in the, on the upper left, uh, and they hatch it just as, as the, in late April, just uh, just maybe a week before buds open, and you have these little larvae. We we sometimes have as many 20, as 20 larvae per bud. I mean, the densities are huge, uh, but those densities decline fairly rapidly in the larvae stage. But winter moths get in and get out fast. They 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 had they do not tolerate um, the the, the Accumulation of tannin compounds in oak leaves. That was work done done in Oxford years and years ago. So there's a number of species that do that. So leaves have the highest nitrogen right when they are first open. So there's a whole suite of species that take advantage of that early in the season. So when the moths are done by uh, late May, they drop out of the trees. All the defoliation happens in May, and they go down into the soil and uh, they spin these little cocoons showed in the lower lower right and they pupate inside those cocoons where they remain all summer long and early fall and then they start to emerge in uh, um, late November. So the, the females have no wings. She devotes all of her energy to egg production. The males are the ones that do the flying. She releases a pheromone that attracts the males and they mate and then she lays her eggs. All right, so we have a pheromone uh, for winter moth. Uh, the, the one on the left, I, I we started out with, I hung that trap myself down on Southeast Mass. You see these hundreds of moths. I mean, that trap filled up in about 15 minutes. Um, so that was a, a big mess to deal with these sticky traps. We now use these um, large capacity traps that have no sticky substance. They have a, 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 um, uh, an insecticide at the bottom that kills the moths. And that's a much easier to deal with. And we can do DNA analysis on those moths. So we have a fender pheromone was identified by Wendell Roloffs back in the 1980s. It, it's a, unlike other moth species, it consists of a single compound. And um, um, most closely related insects use uh, different pheromones or slight modifications to the pheromones, not winter moth. Winter moth and the Bruce Spanworm, which is a native species uh, here, in, here in, in North America, uses the same pheromone. 
Uh, it's, the blue span room is almost never a pest insect, but it's out there everywhere. So unfortunately, the, the traps that we hang everywhere fill up with little brown moths that are either winter moth or Bruce Van Room, and, and they need to be distinguished if we're going to count the winter moths. The wing patterns are completely unreliable. They vary all over the place. Uh, you can look at the genitalia shown here. There's a slight difference in the shape of them. So we started by looking, you know, dissecting all the genitalia. It's very laborious. Um, it works. But we rapidly realized, you know, we can use the uh, DNA, modern DNA analysis to do this. So we started using the CO1 barcoding gene, which is the gene sequence that entomologists all over the place use to identify insects nowadays. So with those tools in hand, we'd hung pheromone traps starting in 2005 all over the Northeast. And Jeff Bettner, my uh, lab tech, brought all these traps up to Maine. Our colleagues in Maine, like Charlie Donahue, hung traps all over Maine. I know up in Nova Scotia. Well, the red shows where we captured winter moths. I mean, we knew about Nova Scotia. I'll come back to that. That winter moth was introduced there in the 1930s. Our colleagues in Maine had never heard of winter moth. They were very surprised to learn that we had recovered winter moth in 2006 at a certain sites along the coast of Maine. But down in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Long Island, winter moth was already causing a lot of defoliation. Well, we quickly realized there's like a link here to winter temperatures. These are the USDA plant hardiness zone maps. And I was surprised to learn that Nova Scotia actually, actually has similar winter temperatures uh, to uh, um, Massachusetts uh, and it's because it's out there in the Gulf Stream. And, but you see there's this nice band of, of warm temperatures along the coast of Maine. But it also explains that the winter moths came into Nova Scotia in the 1930s, but it basically stayed there because it was unable to spread west into New Brunswick and northern Maine because of the cold temperatures. So you can see these two, these two maps match very nicely. Winter moth has a maritime distribution, which is undoubtedly having to, has to do with uh, minimum winter temperatures. And we've done some research to figure out, well, is it the egg stage or whatever? So, but I won't go into all of that today, but you can ask me questions about that. Over the next decade, so it started out north and south of Boston, shown in green in 2004. This is not, this is defoliation. It became a major defoliator, just like the spongy moth, or it used to be gypsy moth. Um, so it was causing large amounts of defoliation all over southeast in Massachusetts and into Rhode Island over the next decade. And it spread, and we had put the term on traps along Route 2 in Massachusetts, <laughs> or oh, east-west uh, road that some of you have traveled on, I'm sure. Anyway. You can see between 2007 and 2009, it was spreading west quite rapidly. The red, again, is winter moth. <laughs> the next thing that happened is we had a big outbreak along the coast of Maine in 2012. That was a big surprise. Undoubtedly, it has to do with the warming of the Gulf of Maine. I've been hearing this talks about my marine, um, marine ecology um, colleague saying that the Gulf of Maine is warming more than any other place in the North Atlantic for whatever reason, and it has an onshore consequences. Suddenly, winter moth is a problem. This is so. This is from 2013. I mean, these are these are the these are the pheromone trap catch that uh, Tom and his colleagues uh, deployed last year. And you see, all of a sudden, traps that used to be Bruce span worm, as in this as in this trap, are now dominated by winter moth. It's really interesting. <laughs> Excuse me, because. Winter moth is displacing Bruce Banworm along the coast of Maine, uh, but it's not happening in Connecticut. I mean, we assume that winter moth would spread west <laughs> along the coast of Connecticut um, because it's warmer there than it is along the coast of Maine. But for whatever reason, winter moth is not spreading in, co in coastal Connecticut. It's pretty much where it is back in 2007. So we're trying to figure out why that is. All right. Well, so. We implemented a biocontrol program because they'd done that successfully in Nova Scotia back in the 1950s. And here are my two uh, collaborators, Jeff Bettner, who worked in my lab for 31 years. He, he did the lion's share of the work. Hannah Broadley was my uh, last graduate student who did some of the important work, which I will describe. And so what is biological control? Well, um, biological control is, is to introduce na um, the, par the natural enemies of invasive species from the countries where they come from. I mean, outside in your backyard, you have 
hundreds of very various insects, and you're not aware of them because they're kept in kept at low density by excuse me the action of these uh, natural enemies. And the natural enemies aren't are out there too, but you're not aware of them because their densities are maintained at low density because they control their 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 food supply, namely the herbivores. It shows a parasite attacking an aphid, and it, it lays its egg in the aphid, and the aphid becomes a the larval um, wasp develops inside the aphid and and kills the aphid in the process. So most uh, biocontrol projects are based on parasitoids like this. There are thousands and thousands of species of these all over the world. So is this a safe thing to do? When I talk about biocontrol, they, people say, oh, my God, well, is this, oh, this wasp or this fly going to take off and become a huge problem? I only know that it is not the case because we do research. We use uh, host range testing. Any candidate parasitoid that we want to introduce is tested to make sure it has a very narrow host range and will not spread to other non-target insects. So there's a USDA permitting process that governs this. So um, back in the good in the old days, no one cared about this. We care about it a lot now. So winter moths have been established uh, three times before uh, in North America. In sometime before 1950, maybe in the 1930s, it became uh, established in Nova Scotia. It took them a long while to figure out it was winter moth. Um, and then in, in uh, Oregon in the 1950s and Vancouver region in the 1970s. And in all three cases, they introduced these, these parasitic flies from, from Europe, the, the parasitic uh, wasp and flies. So Cytelus albicans is the one that we have worked on here. Agapon flaviolatum is another wasp that does the same thing. This shows the, the immature forms of these, uh, these parasitoids. On the left, we have the, the pupa of the, of the Cytelus, the fly, inside the pupa of the parasitoid, of the, of the, of the winter moth. So the fly uh, uh, infects the larval winter moth, but it just hangs out. It waits for the, the, the larval winter moth to complete its development, and then it, the uh, the larva drops to the, to the forest floor and pupates, and then the the fly takes off and uh, uh, kills the pupa and becomes its own pupa. That's the pupa of the fly inside the pupa of the winter moth. And on the right, the same thing. The, the agropon develop inside the pupa of the winter moth, and they hang out until the following spring to attack the next generation. Because there's only one generation a year of winter moths. So here's the Nova Scotia story. And this was done by Doug Embry, who was an amazing person that I had the honor to meet. Um, who, um, so the red line shows defoliation of, of winter moth. And as I said before, once defoliation starts, it just goes on and on. It, it jumps up and down from year to year, but it, um, it, it no, there's nothing that stops it. It just keeps on going. Um, and they introduced a fly, shown in blue in 1954, and for five years they saw nothing. They had no recoveries. I think, I think they had the first recovery maybe in 57, but it, only in 59 did it take off and start causing significant parasitism. The, the, the wasp agrophon they introduced in 56, and but by 1961, it, it, they both were causing high levels of parasitism. The winter moth collapsed in 1962 and has been at low density ever since. In fact, they couldn't collect any more data after 1962 on because on parasitism because they couldn't collect any winter moths. So that's obviously what we wanted to do here in here in New England. The fly has an unusual biology for a parasitoid. Um, we stayed away from the wasp. We focused on the fly because the wasp is a taxonomic model. It's it's not clear whether it's one species or several species. We're not clear about the host range of it. Whereas the, the fly is perfect, it attacks only winter moth. We don't think it even attacks Bruce Van Worm. But it has an unusual biology in that it, instead of laying its eggs on or in the, the larva, it lays its eggs on the leaf surface, those little black specks. I mean, the fly lays thousands and thousands of eggs. They're tiny, and it waits for a winter moth to come along and consume the egg. And when that happens, the fly larva hatches and then burrows into the salivary lands salivary glands of the larva and just hangs out until the, the larva completes development. So it's an unusual biology. There are other uh, parasitic flies that do that, but uh, it's not very usual. So because it's, it's attracted to defoliated leaves, Cydenus is an, an effective parasite at high winter moth density, um, and it lays these small eggs, and it has complete specialists, as I said, and there are no diseases in the system, so the outbreaks just keep on going until we get Cydenus established. 
Okay. Well, how do we collect the fly? Well, you go to the area where the fly is established and try and collect the winter moth larvae, which some of which will have the fly inside them. So this shows Doug Embry. He came out of retirement. I mean, he did his work in the 50s. He joined us for four days, and this is my graduate student, Brenda, um, Brenda Whitehead, and we spent four days collecting winter moths in Nova, in, Nova, in Nova Scotia on apple trees. They were hard to collect because the winter moth is low density. So we only collected 200 larvae, and the hyperacism in these low density populations is low. So we came from, from with a handful of flies. That is not enough. It is biocontrol must be implemented with large numbers. Why is that? If you just release a handful of flies, when they emerge the following generation, they will be unable to find mates and they will readily go extinct. What we need is thousands of these, these, these parasitoids. Luckily, we were able to find that, collect them. So this is Emory Othos out on Vancouver Island where the Cygenus was already established. And for whatever reason, even though it's, it, winter moth is no longer causing defoliation, it's still at relatively high density. You see the tattering on those leaves. So we were able to go out on a good day and collect a thousand larvae. And that's what we need in order to establish. So for seven straight years, my Jeff Bettner, my lab tech, went out and hired the, the moth catheters and they, uh, um, they beat the bushes. Uh, uh, and over a six week period in different places and came back with thousands of larvae. This is just some hotel room. Uh, and in each bucket, there's about 500 caterpillars. Uh, so Jeff would collect the larvae all, all day and then spend the evening collecting enough foliage to keep to keep the caterpillars alive and came and brought back 100,000 100, or so. That's what we need in order to do the project. So the, the uh, the flies then went to Otis Air Base where they have a quarantine lab. We want to make sure we're introducing only the fly and nothing else. The flies shown on the right there look superficially like house flies. Um, but you never know you're out, they're out there because they don't come into your house. And uh, anyway, um, we keep them there over the winter. And then when, in April, when we want to release them, we, you know, we nurture them. We give them hummingbird food. We want to make sure they're, they're healthy and we'll go out and attach winter moths. So this shows our first release, uh, which we did with 225 flies in Hingham, Massachusetts. It was a big media event because by then, winter moth was all over eastern Massachusetts, causing lots of tree defoliation and tree mortality. So it was a huge media event. Uh, and we, but and 225 flies is not very well enough. But slowly but surely, we uh, increased our our uh, techniques for rearing and collecting. So in 2015, we released 28,000 flies at 10 various sites. Each each year, we would add new sites to the system. So over this 16 year period, uh, we established the flies. Um, at all of these locations in several, including several places up in Maine that shown up, shown on this map in Vinyl Haven and various places. And we are continuing that work now. So we established, so the orange circle shows where we established the flies. It, it, again, it takes several years to even detect them after release. So, but we, we did succeed in doing that. And in all, and the, the dotted line shows the out, outbreak areas of winter moth. So how do we attack, attack establishment? Well, we do it the same way we collect the winter moth caterpillars to begin the size in the bushes, so to speak. Uh, we put up these uh, tarps and the caterpillars come raining down on a, on a good tree. You can collect 100 caterpillars and then we uh, rear them in those buckets until pupation. We determine which pupae have the size in and a year later we release the flies. But this is how we determine whether the flies are established as well. Okay, well, the last step in the project uh, was uh, done by my graduate student, Hannah Broadley. And the question we wanted to ask uh, is, is the Cygenus we recover in Massachusetts identical to the Cygenus that we collected in British Columbia? And with our, you know, with our, we now do a bit molecular work in our lab, so we can answer these questions by looking at the CO1 mitochondrial gene. That is the standard barcoding into gene that entomologists like us all over the place identify insects now. And so this shows the actual, the, you know, the tree of uh, the evolutionary tree of, of the sequences of this, of this particular gene. So the, uh, the flies that are identical are grouped together. And what we show here is that indeed the flies shown in red 
which we collected in Massachusetts, match were identical to the flies that we collected in British Columbia, and in, indeed some flies we collected in Nova Scotia. That was the, the the ones that were released in British Columbia came from Nova Scotia, and the ones that were that were uh, um, released in Nova Scotia came from Germany. So we collected some flies from Ger Germany that also matched, and it is significantly different from the flies that we recovered from Bruce Spangroom. So Bruce Spangroom has his own sizeiness but they don't cross interact. So the the the, the flies that we, re, we released and covered uh, in Massachusetts did not come from Bruce Spanworm. That was important to show. Okay, so Spazinus albicons fly has become widely established. But is it lowering winter malt densities? And the answer is yes. Um, <clears throat> so this shows in, in Nova Scotia, it, it basically eliminated uh, um, <clears throat> eliminated uh, winter moth completely from the from the oak forest in the in, in the apple trees it's still present you can still collect it so how do we how do we detect this well every year at various plots around massachusetts we estimated the density of winter moth pupae and that we did that with these little tupperware buckets filled with 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 peat moss this is the same method that was done by our english college back in the 1950s so we know that we put these out under the drip line of the tree. We know the area of the drip line of the tree, and we know the area of these little buckets. So we can calculate the the larvae fall into the buckets. They pupate in the peach moss. Uh, so we have we can estimate pupae per square meter. So that's what we did over a 16 year period um, uh, at these various sites in Massachusetts. Uh, the red line is winter moth density, and as in North Let's go through that density goes up and down. We, we, we now have evidence that it has to do with synchrony with bud burst, which varies from year to year. And then the, again, the blue line is, is the release of Cyzenus albicon. And just as in Nova Scotia, for several years, we would collect nothing. So why is that? Well, you, in every given site, you have 100,000 caterpillars per tree. You, that translates into maybe 10 million caterpillars per acre. And you release a few hundred or few thousand flies, and they have one generation a year. Even if they multiply themselves tenfold, it takes them several years to catch up, even to detect it. The little blue arrow showed when we had the first detector, and several years after that, um, before it actually controls winter moth. I mean, look it up up in the upper right, Hingham, Massachusetts. We we it took us uh, something like seven years to first detect the fly after the first release and about seven more years to actually control winter moth. But in all of these sites, winter moth densities have declined about at least 100 fold. And so we, this is our success. And this shows that the defoliation surveys every year, the state of Massachusetts uh, would do a defoliation survey. And, uh, uh, you know, you can see 100 you know, acres defoliated, 60,000, 60, 100,000. We're talking a major defoliator and a lot of tree mortality. And not to mention the impact of, of winter moth on blueberries and cranberries. They like cranberries, so it's a huge problem. But in 2016, the uh, the population collapsed and has been at low density. Defoliation has been undetectable ever since 2016. That's seven years ago. So we have converted winter moth to a non-pest. Winter moth is still out there. As we were talking about earlier, we can still collect winter moths in various places, but it's not causing the defoliation it used to. So we feel pretty good about this. Successes like this don't happen come very often in one's career. But how about Maine? Well, as I showed in the previous slide, we were we we started releasing flies um, starting in 2016. We released flies in, in Kittery and Two Light State Park, just south of Portland, and in various places, even a vinyl haven up in 2018. And uh, we have established uh, uh, flies at all of these locations. But just like in Massachusetts, it takes year, some years, maybe as much as a decade before the, these flies will increase in density enough to actually uh, prevent defoliation. But we're, the great thing is we're, we've established at all these locations. Back in 2016, we changed our release method. We used to release the adult methods but then more recently, we realized we should just bury the fly pupae and peat moss in these little in these little containers and let the flies emerge. Do that in in in, in the fall. And the flies emerge when when they think it's the appropriate time. We've had much better success with that. So we have almost immediate recovery of flies 
uh, at these release sites in Maine. And that's a good sign because it gives us a big head start in, in controlling the flies and controlling the winter moth at all of these sites. So the, um, it takes a while. I mean, uh, now here are the various sites where we have established the flies. All of the flies are established, present parasitism. I mean, Cape Elizabeth was one of our, our, our biggest successes in the last year. Um, we, you know, in 2021, we had significant levels of parasitism. And when we went back there this year, this spring, we couldn't find any winter moths. In Kittery, on the other hand, um, we established the flies way back, I think it was in 2014. It's taken a while for the to, for the flies that, but with these high levels of parasitism, uh, 30, 35 percent, and this last year 20 percent, that's high enough to bring bring the population down. That's what those are the numbers we needed in Massachusetts to bring it down. So I'm quite confident that the kittery population of Winnemouth will collapse. So we're just getting started in these various locations, and we'll see what happens. But we feel quite confident we can do in Maine what we have done. In, in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, the work is ongoing. We'll keep it. We'll keep it going. We will extend these, extend these, uh, these releases up right up along, all the way up to the Canadian border as 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 we need. Working, you know, under the guidance of our our main colleagues. All right. Well, so the next question I want to answer is, well, okay, it's all very well. We brought the populations down. But what will regulate the low density populations after the fly is established? Will the cytinus regulate the low density population of winter moths that now exist in, in eastern New England? And the answer is no, probably not. Why do I think that? Well, there's a lot of data from Nova Scotia and elsewhere where, um, the, as I mentioned before, cytinus albicans is a high density specialist. It seeks defoliated leaves. When there's no defoliation, it has a much harder time finding uh, uh, leaves to lay its eggs on. So in Nova Scotia, parasitism was 40 to 60 percent in, in, in 1962. But it's, in subsequent years, um, work particularly done in apple orchards, so it dropped to around 10 percent. And that was what we found when we went to Nova Scotia in 2003. You know, it was about 5 percent. So Cydenus um, by itself will not regulate these populations. And there was some lovely work done by Jens Rowland out in uh, Vancouver Island showing that soil predators now regulate the low density populations of, 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 of winter moth now that they've been brought down. And that sort of matches the uh, the story that um, was told in this little book that was published in 1973. And these indi these individuals were studying winter moth in um, <clears throat> Uh, in Oxford in England, and they it was not an outbreak population, but they were able to collect winter moths. It shows the winter moth uh, density per square meter, renders to 10, 100, 1,000. Um, and the, the thing that they showed is the mortality caused by pupae was increased with the density of winter moth, and that's what you need for the population to regulate. And the upper graph she shows that the variation from year to year in larval mortality and overwintering mortality, and that varied hugely, but it did, it did not regulate the density. You need to show density dependence. So this, the idea is captured in this slide, is that in order for a population to be held at equilibrium at low density, which is what we're after, there has to be a balance between the birth rate, i.e. the fecundity, and the death rate. And you need one or more agents where the death rate will increase as the density increases, so that the birth rates and the death rates are balanced, where each female replaces herself once. And that's true of almost all in species, but you need some agent that behaves where the dense, where the um, death rate, the proportion killed, increases with the density. So that's the, the project taken on by uh, my graduate student, uh, um, Hannah Broadley, it's in Ecological Applications, it's now published. Uh, um, and uh, she did these studies on winter moth pupae deployed at various locations in, in southeastern Massachusetts. So over a five year period, she deployed something like 14,000 winter moth pupae. The way she did this, uh, the, the pupae were what we rear out from, uh, from, the, from the larval collections. They're in the, inside those little cocoons that I showed you. And you glue the cocoon to these little burlap squares and deploy them out, 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 in, the, out in the field. And because they're in the, we use beeswax to do that, the, 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 the pupae are, are, are not harmed by that. 
and put them on these burlaps so we can recover the pupae. You, you can't just bury them in the soil. You'd never find them again. So you took them out and then bring them back and dissect them and look and find out, well, what proportions have been eaten by predators. They removed the, the, the pupae. What proportion have been attacked by parasitoids and uh, and what proportion have been eaten by by shrews? There's a whole suite of of, of predators out there, hundreds of you know, well not hundreds, 29 species of carabid beetle, 30 species of of roe beetle. All of them are larval uh, beetles that are feeding on things in the in the litter. Hannah discovered uh, that we didn't uh, a species we did not know about. It's a, a parasitoid attacking these pupae. And it turned out with her DNA work to be two two different species that were indistinguishable. One one of them is Pimplo aqualis. We got an ID from our our taxonomic collaborators, but uh, the the two species are both are Pimplo. Uh, they're both identical morphologically. One of them is a different new species unknown to science. We don't know which one is which because they're morphologically identical. Anyway, in this experiment, she put out pupae inside these little wire mesh cages shown in the upper, upper um, right-hand corner. You keep out various predators, and so she varied the mesh size. So with no, with no, with no cages uh, in this experiment, yes, you know, up nearly 70% of the pupae were, were eaten over a relatively short period. If you... If you um, Reduce the mesh size. You include, you exclude one or more species of the larger predators, and you. So what this shows is the uh, predation rates on these pupae uh, slowly declined over, over, uh, uh, over these different mesh sizes. All of which shows that that all of these predators are feeding on winter moth pupae. There's not just one. So it's a community of predators that are are feeding on these pupae, and they cause lots of mortality. Um, and you know, up to ninety percent of the pupae are typically eaten over the lifespan of the winter moth. So it's 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 a huge source of mortality. And as I said before, a pegulate will regulate the density, will cause an equilibrium only if the percent mortality it causes increases with per, the, with the pupil density. So this shows that to be true for Massachusetts. So here again in the upper left hand corner is the data that were produced by Barley and Gradwell um, in England at Oxford, showing that, that the pupil density increases from 10 to 32 to 100 pupils per square meter. The rates of mortality increase. So there's an equilibrium that occurs somewhere up here where the population stays at, at this density. Um, but there's other data from, from, from England in other locations where we actually have higher densities of winter moth pupae. I mean, 10,000 pupae per square meter, that's inconceivable. We've never seen anything like that. But here's our data uh, from Massachusetts. And at first, we saw no pattern. But um, the open circles, um, um, the, the open circles were the data we took before Cytinus was established. So we just saw no pattern. Uh, but when, as soon as we established Cytinus, the densities have come down. Indeed, they're and dense, and they're entirely comparable to what they are in England. And now, the as the density increases, the uh, predation rates on these pupae increase. So the point is that winter moth plays a critical role here. It brings the densities down uh, to a to a density at which the pupae, the predators, can cope with them. When the densities are up, up over a thousand, you know, up over a thousand pupae per square meter, there's simply too many pupae for the moths to for the predators to eat, and they can't keep up with it. So uh, this shows that just like um, uh, Jens Rowan showed in, in in British Columbia and our English colleagues showed, pupil, pupil, pupil predators regulate the system at low density. So all of this shows that impacts of a biocontrol agent cannot be understood unless we account for the other agents acting in the system. There aren't that many studies that do this. I mean, it takes a lot of work to try and account for all these other sources of mortality, but that's what we have always tried to do. And then and only then can you explain the dynamics of the system. All right, so to control, to summarize the biocontrol story, um, as of 2020, we've established Cytinus at 41 locations from coastal Maine, and it's now spread across the high range density. We are continuing that work 
working in, uh, along the coast of Maine. We expect to achieve that objective over the next few years. And um, the foliation by winter moth in, in Massachusetts and Rhode Island is no longer detectable, and the low density population will be maintained by predators in the soil. There are many people who collaborated on this, including our colleagues here in Maine. Charlene Donahue worked with us for many, many years. Tom Schmilk and Colleen Tierling have been more recent collaborators. So none of this would have been possible without the help of all of these people. Okay, there's one more topic I wish to cover, and that has to do with the population genetics of winter moth. <laughs> and you know, and that has to do, I mean, particularly. Where does winter moth come from in in New England? And that work is led by Jeremy Anderson. Uh, he now is, is basically in the process of taking over my lab. When I retire, he will he will he will he has a a research assistant professor position. So he's bringing us into the 21st century because all of our ecological work now and in, now involves in a molecular dimension as, as I've shown already. So um, to analyze the um, the winter moth system. We use microsatellites. They're rep repeated fragments of DNA, and they vary highly between individuals. They're actually used in in forensic science to identify, you know, if, in, in which uh, identify individuals who've caused crime based on you know the DNA they leave in a coffee cup, that kind of thing. Anyway, we we use this for the winter moth, and here's here's the uh, the variation we see of the uh, uh, winter moth DNA. This is all all within species variation, and we've had colleagues from all over Europe where we have attained winter moth. So each vertical line represents the, the the genetic profile of an individual moth. So we can see we've done thousands of moths from all over the world, uh, and this doesn't even show all of our data. But um, the thing that jumps at us immediately is that. The, the uh, moths from Maine, shown, shown here in, in the lower right, uh, match the moths from New York, Massachusetts, and the rest of New England, and they are completely different from the moths that came from Nova Scotia. I mean, I have always assumed that the moths we had in Maine and, and New England probably crept along the coast of Maine, and, uh, and when they found the friendly, uh, the friendly temperatures in Massachusetts, they exploded. And I used to have a little sort of a running joke with Charlene Donahue. I mean, she was convinced that the moths that they had in Maine came from New England, and I was convinced the moths uh, that, that we had in New England came from came from Maine via Nova from Nova Scotia via Maine. Well, Charlene was right. The moths in Maine came from New England and not from Nova Scotia. I mean, we're continuing this work. I mean, how about those moths that we caught just recently up near Machaya, so uh, we're far down east? Do they uh, do they match the moths in Nova Scotia? So we're going to continue investigating because we knew from earlier work that winter moths established not only in Nova Scotia was present at various places along the coast of New Brunswick way back in the 1960s. So there's still more to get here. But anyway, the moths from from Maine came came from somewhere else. Well. And then the moth from British British Columbia, shown here, BC and Oregon, they don't match either. I mean, you can see that they match the moths from from New Europe pretty well, but the moths from from Nova Scotia and Maine don't match anything. So why is that? I mean, we have surveyed the world. We've surveyed, you know, Japan, the Far East. I don't know. I'm showing just a little bit of it here, but the really interesting pattern in Maine. The moths in Eastern Europe are quite different, as shown in red from the moths in Western Europe, and then the moths, well, I'm sorry, um, oops. the moths in Scotland and, and England are very similar to the ones in Spain. Why would that be? Well, the reason why that is has to do with the uh, Europe during the last ice age looked like this, um, where the, the forest shown in green retreated to certain glacial refugia. So we had one group of forests here in in, in Eastern Europe, um, Italy and uh, what's now Serbia, et cetera, and another group here in, in the Iberian Peninsula in Spain, and they were separated from one another for, for 10,000 10, 10, years or more. And so what's happened when uh, the ice, ice age retreated and the forest returned, the moths from from shown in the dotted area from Eastern Europe moved into in the central in what is now Western Europe, and the moths from Spain moved north. So the ones you have in in um, 
in France and Germany are a mixture of the ones from Eastern Europe and the ones from Spain, whereas the moths from Spain made their way to England more than any of the moths from the East. And so that's why the, the moths in Scotland and, and England match the ones from Spain. Well, that's that's the European story. How about so how about where where do our moths come from? I mean, the problem. Well, let me go back here. Why are they so different in name and in New England and Nova Scotia, different from anything else? It's, they're different because of what we call a founder effect. The ones in New England and the ones in Nova Scotia could have been started by a single moth. And it's the genetic profile of that moth that then governs the, the, the populations we now have in Nova Scotia and we now have in New England. And so that's why we do not get a match anywhere. Well, there is a statistic sophisticated DNA analyses that um, Jeremy um, applied, it's called the DIY ABC program that uh, handles these, these, these uh, um, bottleneck effects caused by these um, bottleneck caused by restrictions when they migrate. So he analyzed over 1300 moths from 20 European countries to find out where do our moths come from here in England, in New England. And what he discovered was there, there were four separate introductions. So the moths that we have in, in, in New England do not match the, the moths in Nova Scotia because they, they were introduced separately. And there were separate introductions to the, to the West Coast also. So that's the answer to the story. We had four separate introductions from Europe, from different locations in Europe to North America. Again, we had a huge number of collaborators, Europeans from all over the, from all over Europe, including Russia, et cetera, sent us moths. Um, and uh, that's pretty much the end of my story. I mean, the main thing I wanted, I mean, there's all these people to thank. Um, two people, Dick Reardon and Ron Weeks for the USDA, understood that projects like this take decades to implement. It took us six. 16 years to do this project in New England, and we're still at it. We're not done yet. We still have Maine to do. Um, and, and it's the main thing, about, I mean, I, I am so blessed to work with these lovely young people. I mean, who, what, what, you know, I come every day and I work with these people. What could be better than that? So that's why I'm still doing it, even though I could have retired some years ago. So that's, that's the end of my story. Joe, it was an excellent talk. Um, I learned a lot, actually, uh, just in those short 50 minutes. Um, so, hold on, let me see what is going on in the chat here. Um, I've just enabled the mics and cameras, so if folks want to ask questions on mic or, or um, in the chat, either one will work. I might okay. have to, you might have to repeat the question for me because I'm my hearing is not as, as good as it should be. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, if anybody wants to has any questions that they'd like to type into the chat, or um, they could ask them, and I will um, restate them. Nancy, I see you're on. Yes, good morning. Thanks so much for this um, talk and for hosting. It's great to learn more about these programs. The last comment that you made regarding the patience of your supporters at USDA and US Forest Service, I just would like you to speak a bit more about that because this is not a unique case, obviously, of needing that much time. And I hope to learn from you, what did you say to your collaborators? What were the messages that they needed to hear in order to allow the funding to um, take that long because that's so unusual um, and necessary in our invasive species work. Thank you. Well, it's a good question, and I don't know if you know of Dick Reardon. Uh, Dick Reardon is sort of, uh, I mean, I organized a symposium in his honor a few years ago because he's done this not just for me. He's a Forest Service employee, and he retired just recently, but he funded people like me uh, for for decades, because he understood this. I mean, he understood that not just my program, but any biocontrol program takes decades to do. I mean, I was lucky in that in the, well, the Canadians had already done the host test, range testing work. Many of these, like we're working now on emerald ash borer. The first decade was devoted to collecting the parasitoids from China and testing them in the lab to see which ones were generalists and specialists. 
And then only after that did it have the introduction taken place. So it's the same thing with that species. Um, and the, there's a handful of people in the USDA, Dick Reardon was one of them, and Ron Weeks, who works for USDA APHIS, they understood that. Most, most uh, people who are funding us don't understand that, but these key individuals did. And so none of this would have happened without their, without their input. Of course, they had faith in it. They, they knew that I'm mean, Roy Van Dreis was my colleague. They knew that we, you know, we deliver when they fund us. <laughs> that is very crucial. And yes, a lot of I mean, some. We are willing. There aren't that many people like us who are, who are willing to do a 16 year project. But we, we, we know we ourselves know it takes that. And that's what, that's why we're funded and not other people. Yeah, no, sometimes these, uh, the funding is for a year and you need 15, 20 years to see it through. Absolutely. Um, so there's a couple of questions in the chat here. Um, have flies been released in South Bristol, Maine? And I can answer that. And, uh, this past year's release in, um, May of this year was actually in South Bristol. Um, and like Joe mentioned during his presentation, it's not going to be an uh, an immediate fix. It, it does take a number of years, but we have also noticed the um, intense winter moth defoliation in on that peninsula. Um, but yes, we we have flies uh, that are hopefully in winter moth pupa in the ground, um, and we will be going back to those uh, to that site, like we have our previous release sites to. Um, determine if they've gotten established, but we're, like Joe also mentioned, we're not likely to to um, recapture them uh, until uh, two or, or three years after the release. The map that uh, I showed, the map that I showed was uh, the, m the map where we have recovered Cizenas. I didn't really have the information on where you may have released Cizenas, but we have not yet recovered them. Um, there's another question from Lynn. Um, what is the spread of the Cizenus when it is released? What is the spread? Well, um, when we did a study of that, actually, I didn't show it because I, you know, I only had, you know, an hour to talk. I could go on for the next hour as well. But um, um, we did a study of that in Wellesley where we had the first recovery and we mapped, we did these transects. And we mapped the spread of Cizenus over, um, e you know, in six different directions, north, east, south, and west, and um, um, from Wellesley. And over a period of, of about two or three years, it, Wellesley has, the infestation of Cizenus in Wellesley spread into Boston, spread into Framingham. It spread over, uh, uh, you know, a 20 kilometer or whatever that is, a, a 12 mile uh, in every direction over a period of about three years. So, you know, these sites, Cythenus has spread all across the landscape. We're recovering it anywhere we look in New England nowadays. At least, at least in Southern New England, not necessarily in Maine. Not yet, but we'll get there. And Lynn just says that's, that's encouraging. Um, okay, another question from uh, Dave. Uh, you mentioned that winter moth hasn't spread further south and west into coastal Connecticut. Do you have any sense why? And what are the implications for this uh, and brown tail moth in the face of climate change? Well, I don't, you know, I, I did some work on brown tail moth, as some of you may know, suggesting that a parasitoid uh, that attacked what we now call spongy moth. Comptura continata will play a big role in driving it to extinction in southern New England. What's the story in Maine? I know Ellie Groden has a student, had some students working on that system. And so I don't know what, what the latest story on that. I I hope <laughs> it doesn't come to Massachusetts because I, you well know it's a very nasty insect. Uh, and uh, I know directly because uh, we used to work on it. But um, uh, let's see. Why it's not spreading in Connecticut? I mean, we have which we're looking into that. I mean, we think that hybridization between winter moth and Bruce manworm has a negative effect on winter moth. And so that as you come east, winter moth has essentially driven uh, Bruce manworm to extinction in eastern Massachusetts, in eastern Connecticut. But in western Connecticut, it's having Bruce manworm is driving winter moth to extinction 
because it, when, there, there's so many that we know the hybrids are they do not survive very well and in an area where you have a hundred Bruce Bandworm for every winter moth that trade in there they they mate almost entirely with Bruce Bandworm and those uh, those offspring do not survive so hybridization is a, between the two species is a major uh, negative effect on each on each population of each one. You think that's what's happening in coastal Connecticut, but why that's not happening in Maine is an open question. We're really interested in that, and we are pursuing it. But you know, because I mean, we always, as I said before, it's, it's clear that winter moth is 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 restricted to the coastal areas because of the winter temperatures. So exactly how does that work? Um, we have done experiments where we deployed winter moth eggs in various places in interior New England. The eggs seem to survive pretty well unless you put them up in the in the you know the the, the high mountains up up in the White Mountains or anything. So we 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 suspect that one feature is that um, we know that winter moths fly in December, and every now and then you get a year where you get an early snowfall, like in early December, and the ground freezes, and that's it for the winter moths. It, you know the population is obliterated for that reason. Um, so that's, I think that's probably the main reason why winter moth does not incur going to the interior. But we're 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 still working on this. There's a lot we don't know about winter moth. Even all the work we've done, there's more to do, and we we're planning to do it. And so I don't have a good answer to that question. I mean, why is it, is it different on the coast of Maine than coastal Connecticut? Because coastal Connecticut, after all, is warmer than the coast of Maine. Excellent points. Um, okay, does any, uh, we're sort of at the end of the time uh, that we've scheduled for this uh, webinar, but does anybody have um, a last question or final question? Oh, uh, Allison says, is there any work done or planned on lawn care maintenance regimes and soil predator communities? <laughs> Uh, uh, well, I mean, it's such a complex system. There's so many soil predators. I mean, that you, you now you're talking about a you know a, another 10 year research project. I I don't think we're uh, we're probably not going to take that on. Um, okay. Uh, if there are no other questions, um, I will release you all uh, for recess. And there's a, a lot of thank yous and, and great talks, uh, comments pouring through. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it. I always enjoy this. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, very, very informative. Excellent talk. OK. Um, can we post that uh, link to the quiz again? Yep. Uh, so as a reminder, um, those of you who are uh, applying for PESIDE credits, um just make sure that you fill out the quiz it's a five question quiz um i'm putting the link to it in the chat here um just make sure that you fill out that quiz in order to receive pesticide credit 